Americans to undertake closer to victory. And for all of you out there caught up behind the lines, this is your song. Stop. 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 Stop.
uh, that's uh, outside of Dayton, Ohio. Or maybe it's in Dayton, Ohio. I don't know. And then we got the Cowboy Museum started up in Oklahoma City um, in 1955. And they've only got 100 firearms there, but they uh, do they do have some decent firearms. I call them the Firearms Museum. Yeah, it looks like you got it figured out. Uh, you're on a phone or you're on a computer? No, I'm on a laptop. I had a bunch of instances of Chrome running away with, with my machine. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, I was just going through and mentioning I was working on that video that I kind of talked about, I think, earlier in the week and uh, needed to get the museums in some sort of order and not just the order I found them or discovered them. So uh, I've just been working on the polishing up some of the websites or the websites got polished up in my efforts here, I guess you could say. And uh, that's what I've been focusing on. So I just have the, the new list of, I can put this in the side chat. So we have the chat that's going on with everybody. And then we have this private chat over here so I can drop that uh, cycle directly. Uh, but we've got, um, I've just been going through the list here, going through some of the museums. Some of the other things we can talk about is what's going on on the calendar today. Uh, we had two things today, which are uh, uh, Colt died and um, was he? Logan with uh, High Caliber History had posted some more details about that that I didn't know. And then today's the day that the Glock book came out. I never figured we'd talk about that a little bit. In the process of working on the gun sh or the, the video about museums, and I think I talked about this a little bit yesterday that I'm trying to, as I leave advocacy, I'm going to drop all my notes onto the internet. And one of them was that the museums need to do some stuff to encourage participation. Uh, as I'm working on that video and figuring out things that needed to go into the calendar, I also figured out some activists that I was missing. And, uh, so I've got that list over here as well. So we can chat about any or all of this or none of this. Uh, this is a uh, panel discussion. So these are just some topics we can bring up. And uh, now that Cycle's in here, we just chatted about museums yesterday. So that's up to you if you want to keep digging into that with the new uh, insight as to which what order they were created. Uh, otherwise, uh, what's been happening in the East Coast? Well, things have been pretty quiet the last couple of days, but we do have a, uh, our legislative session opens uh, in the, uh, on the 5th of February. And uh, we have a lot of real bad stuff on the table because, you know, the Dems are going nuts. But uh, so we're, we're, you know, getting ready for that. And we have our, our CCDL, you know, which is the, the Connecticut equivalent of the VCDL. Uh, we have our, uh, our yearly dinner is coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. And, uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. We, we got a new president, the, the president of the CCDL for many years, uh, decided to step down and, uh, we have a, actually, we have a gal that stepped in to his, uh, shoes and she's very pro to a, uh, and, uh, I think it'll be pretty interesting now on the news when the news gets our, our take on things that it'll be, a uh, you know, a young lady, uh, standing up and talking about this stuff, which is not something they're really used to. Right on. So um, you brought up a lot of stuff that's going on there. Um, I was thinking you've been posting some videos because when you first jumped back, uh, you've mentioned, you know, just, you know, you've been doing stuff and whatever, and you just haven't been posting videos. So I noticed you've been posting some videos and uh, I was wondering, uh, like, I guess, what kind of response you've been getting on those or what. But uh, since you brought up the that stuff, a um, couple of things. The Connecticut uh, Citizens Defense League, the CCDL, um, was present and had a large presence actually at the 2A rally that went on in November last year. And again, we weren't just you know we weren't chatting as much, so um, I don't remember at least chatting with you about that. Um, were you aware that they were busing people down to the Virginia, or I mean, to the D.C. rally back in? Yeah, ab absolutely. But unfortunately, I already was out of state for that weekend. Yeah, that's what I figured. But um, uh, so I just wanted to give them credit because, yeah, they've this isn't like the first time they've done something. And the way that you said is like our version of the VCDL. I'm going to give VC, Virginia Citizens Defense League credit because that's what our Arizona Citizens Defense League is also based on. So that was 
there and it's not, I don't think they instigated. I think they existed and they were valid. So people looked to them as a blueprint. I don't think they were franchising or anything. They, they just were valid. They were doing well. And people said, hey, that's a good blueprint to go from. They were willing to let people do it and they went from it. But I don't want to make it seem like um, Connecticut is some like lesser, you know, secondary version of a BCDL, uh, the CCDL awesome organization. If you're going to give money to an organization that's out of state and you're wonder, wondering which one's a good one, I can definitely recommend CCDL. So that's my second question, leading up, giving them a pat on the back or whatever for their past accomplishments. Do you think they're sending people to Virginia again? Or do you know, are they sending people to Virginia for stuff? Or do you guys have your stuff kind of at the same time? So that's not such a given, I don't think. Yeah, I have not heard anything yet. Uh, uh, it's not that far. And, uh, you know, time-wise, I think yours was like, am I wrong? Yours is the 18th or the 22nd and theirs is the 20th. So it would be like, if that's yeah, the case, right on top. Cool. Yeah. And if so they're the 20th, then it's definitely, you know, well, sorry, we got to defend our own state. We don't have a lot of people here. Right. But uh, anyway, so that's, yeah, I mean, I wish, I, 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 I don't know, maybe you can help me through this. I, you know, I, you know, I, what I've been doing over the years, and it's frustrating to me to hear that, you know, there's things like this now where we have a bit of tension. We have some, you know, a lot of stuff stacking and, uh, the, you know, the having accomplished like organization and um, some um, first steps, at least, you know, some attempts at, or, uh, at uh, rallying or something to get people, mo you know, not just motivated, but actually showing up to places. If we would have had a bit more experience with that, I could see all this stuff happening in Virginia and in your states now, you know, being so much easier to defend or whatever. But at the same time, big deal. You can be frustrated about whatever. Um, and I don't want to only look at what we could have done because I think we still did quite a bit. And I don't know. I guess I'm frustrated because I'm out here. And the best thing I can do is offer, you know, awareness and an organization and as it gets close to a deadline, what can you do? You got you just feel more and more frustrated and helpless. And you, all I can really is look back and go, "Oh shit, we could have, you know, if only we would have had more organization. What could we be accomplishing right now?" Yeah, and it is it is kind of sad because the, uh, you know, sometimes circumstances, you know, you, you fight the good fight, and and sometimes it's circumstances that screw you, and it's not anything that you did. I mean, remember uh, uh, CCDL spent almost a million dollars uh, fighting the uh, the gun laws here in Connecticut right up to the Supreme Court. And wouldn't you know that the week before they were supposed to decide on the whether they were going to take the case, that's when Scalia died. You yeah, know? exactly. And, and I think it would have gone very differently. You know, and then they elected not to take the case. And, of course, that just in... Uh, the Democrats in my state just said, ha, 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 see, you know, you guys can't get out of this stuff no matter what. Um, you know, if we were to bring that case again today, which, of course, we can't, but uh, but I think it would have had a very different outcome if Scalia hadn't died the week before. Yeah, I, that's a perfect example. And I don't know if this is so if we take the details out of that, that's exactly the scenario, I guess, that I was trying to allude to is that. How do you, and, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to voice this good, but like uh, what I'm looking at there is that you've got, like you say, you can effort, you can coordinate, you can achieve, and you can, you know, get everything ready, do everything you can, and then something like that out of, what's it called, like uh, circumstances beyond anybody's control happen. And uh, a lot of times that's what it is, is a personal thing or a family thing or something happens and personally an individual gets taken out and if that person if that individual is critical can take down a whole campaign or a whole motivation of a group of people right um so my question is since you're kind of looking at that angle of what you brought up is it possible for a group to get to, to harden itself against that or to to is that something that can be defended against or can a system be put in place other than I, I think the obvious would be not have any heroes like not have individuals that are that necessary so that if 
nothing depends on them faltering. Well, yeah, but that wasn't us. That was the Supreme Court. I mean, we had no control over that at all. Oh, but no, no, I'm not just using that as an example to yeah. what something that's been bug bugging me is that I see so many, so often over the years now, because I keep looking back. It's the year end. It's going into SHOT Show 15th year, probably my last year of giving a shit about trying to get people motivated. So as I'm looking back and like wondering myself, like, you know, I want, I'm going to pull a Ken Blanchard. I'm going to retire before I put my foot in my mouth or just die, you know, on the toilet stressed out because I'm trying to do shit that's out of my control. So going forward, um, uh, that's a, a, like I say, that specific one, there's nothing nobody could have done to prevent that other than, I mean, that's just bad timing or something. But I think that illustrates that, um, like I say, over the years, I've seen people that have done things and then for whatever reasons had to check out. And because they checked out, their whole project stopped, like all the motivation stopped. Is there a way to resolve it or to resist against that or to build structure? Yeah, well, that? I mean, part of that is is building up a bench of people. So, for instance, when Scott decided, Scott's the guy that was running our uh, CCDL. And uh, I'll tell you what, you, you, you really couldn't find a more cool, collected, calm-headed guy. I mean, he would go on the TV shows and stuff, and they would bait him incessantly. And he would just, these are the facts. This is what's going on. You know, I, you know, we, we respectfully disagree. The guy was great at that. Well, this gal that it's taken over for him is also a very strong presence. And it was, I, I think the only reason he stepped down was because he knew she was going to step in and fill the void. But another thing that they're doing, which I think is a great idea is they've said, look, we can't run this as a centrally managed top heavy organization anymore. We need to get more boots on the ground assistance and start spreading the responsibility a little bit. So this year they've come up with a new, a new strategy where they're going to have area coordinators and they're going to try to get a town. Cause one of the things they do is they watch the laws. We, we don't have uh, uh, what do you call it? Preemption. You know, the, 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 the little towns and stuff can, can override their own. Yeah. Oh, they could drive, they drive you nuts and, and they can't follow them. They can't watch them. Like we had one guy, all he was doing was watching when people were violating the state gun laws, you know, about, about permits and stuff. And, and he was busier in a one arm paper hanger. I mean, he just, it was just, it's just becoming impossible for him to do that. So what they're doing is they're, they're trying to get area coordinators and they're trying to bust the state up into regions. And we all, we already have kind of regions because of how the counties work. You know, we have like eight or 10 major counties, that kind of thing, but we have 169 towns. And so they're trying to get a person from each town just to be responsible for watching what the town board is doing and what they might be pulling, you know, that, that impacts the second amendment. And it's a, it's a pretty simple thing. And it's not like they're going to get them together all the time, but they'll have a regional coordinator. And when, when, and each town will have its guy or two that is watching what his people are doing. And when they're doing something, it's not like that person has to do anything about it, except pass it up the chain of command and say, Hey, here's something we need to pay attention to. And so that's a very soft, uh, you know, you don't have to sign. It's not a big commitment. It doesn't take multiple days a week or you're throwing away your weekends or that kind of thing. So it, you know, it sounded like a pretty good way to do it. It's basically divide and conquer. And, and rather than have these great big jobs that are so massive that no one wants to take them over because there's so much work involved and you're, you know, you're working your regular you know, 60 hours a week, like everybody else. And now on top of that, you got to run, you got to work another 40 hours a week for CGDL. Now it's just kind of a, it's, you, know, you stop by the town, you know, the, the town hall once a week and you check the boards and make sure, you know, you, you get on the mailing list for the, uh, you know, the, the committees that are meeting and you find out what they're proposing and that kind of stuff. And that's a, a nice soft way of getting into it. And, and I thought that was a great idea There's somebody, somebody really got their head screwed on straight. Yeah. Now, is that something that is, are you saying that is starting or it's been going? No, it's just starting. Okay. They just yeah. started, they just started putting that together this year. Yeah. Though they were talking about it towards the end of last year. I mean, I'm already on the legislative committee uh, for my gun club, but, uh, but yeah, this is, uh, 
you know, this is a new thing they're going to try for this year. Now, of course, we have a lot of holes and it's like any other organization. I mean, we have like the Aries organization for amateur radio emergency service. And there are a lot of holes in that structure where there should be people in certain positions, but they aren't there. So it's going to take us a while to get our feet under us. But I just think the whole concept of make the job small enough that you can hand it to somebody and it's not a huge imposition and you got a much better chance of getting someone to do it. And now you've got 169 people watching what's going on in a state instead of like three. And, and, and that's, I think that's just a great idea, you know, divide and conquer delegate. You know, the whole deal is people that are effective in business or in building anything know how to delegate. And they're, I think they're finally getting it. You know, we had a very strong CCDL board. They were very good at what they did, but they worked their asses off to make it happen. And I think this is going to make life a little easier for them and, and, and make ultimately make them more successful. Right on. That's awesome summary of, uh, I don't know what to call it, like the evolution of the challenge to, to deal with the also cha changing, I guess, increasing uh, amount of stuff to pay attention to or the amount of stuff to be aware of, right? Yeah, and it's not just it's not just all volunteer, and we'll tell you what you're going to do later. It, they already, you know, you on one piece of paper you could put. Th this is what you're going to do as the town monitor, you know, and that makes it very easy to to, uh, you know, okay, I can see that, and that's got that's got good boundaries, you know. I'm not going to get sucked into stuff and and then eventually spend my whole life doing this. So it was, uh, you know, a pretty good deal. So I mean, the reason I'm asking is because a couple of things. Again, I'm it's just a time of year, or whatever. I'm looking at uh, uh, doing you know what happened last year, what decade type of stuff, and uh, uh, again, with my kind of the same as my other uh, question I asked originally is, um, you see things that are great ideas or good good concepts. Or maybe they're not perfect, but you know, once they polish, because you know that everything gets better once a bunch of people check it out and it gets polished a little bit. So, you know, there's lots of these times and little things. It's tough to try to remember all the little things. It's tough to remember. It's a challenge to remember the things that were semi-successful. You know, that still crapped out, but definitely more stuff starts than actually completes or is effective or whatever. So, um, again, looking forward as to how we can change the systems and not just get better at being, you know, get better at treading water. We could be the perfect at treading water and then, you know, watch eight other people tread water and learn even better ways to tread water and then eventually get to where we tread water so well, we could hold other people up while we tread water. But that whole time we could have just been learning how to swim. And even if we sucked at swimming, you know, and even if we just figured out that we could go with the street, you know, the current or something like that, we could get, we could cover some ground. And that's right. I can't help but look back at 15 years and see there's lots of attempts to to get, you know, people are splashing into this arena, you know, defense of our rights. And uh, you, you, we're all alone. We're all jumping in alone. And that's either geographically or area of interest or personality, whatever the barriers are, you know, lack of ability to reach. You know, before we had Internet, it was really difficult to get people to understand that you're over here swimming or shredding water. So uh, using all these analogies together, um, I was trying to figure out how to, you know, maybe a strategy to offer organizations going forward. And that might be a way to do it is, but the um, reason I asked the question is you brought it up from the angle of amount of stuff there is to cover. And that's valid a hundred percent. I was thinking of it from the effect of as one person, even if you're full time doing it and you're really interested, you get burnout. Like just watching all the onslaught of stuff and the repetition and the silliness and the seriousness occasionally, but the just the overwhelming like flow of anti, you know, gun prohibition type of stuff. It's just too much. Unless you're the kind of person who can just really deal with a lot of it and you don't get take it personally or nothing. But I think for most of us, we take it kind of personally and it's frustrating to see something anytime we, you know, we falter or we fail or we just don't even stand up to, to some of it. And it just happens because they've confused us. They've been successful in keeping us frustrated and, 
and apathetic and we just weren't even there to show up um when you start being aware of that stuff especially on a even a weekly but a daily basis it's you got to have concrete whatever the word is to like blinders to the to all of it and even then what are you gonna do it eight hours a day you got to have four hours of fun just to deal with the stress of that i would think so i think the idea of having a bunch of people together just nibbling on it is effective in more than one way and the burnout is the way i was thinking of it so i think that it, you know that's well you, you, you definitely need to have uh depth on your bench and and just like you know there's only five guys at a time out there on that basket basketball team but there's 15 of them sitting on the bench and anytime somebody gets weary and, and needs to come out, needs a break, they pick somebody else and they throw him in there. Now, he may not be the as good as the other guy was, but he knows the job. He understands what he's got to do, and he gives that other guy a break so that if, if, if he's just you know tired, overrun, or gets hurt, he can, he can fill in for him. And, and a lot of our organizations are very fragile because we don't have any depth on the bench. You know, you've got the – one or two big, like you said, the big movers and shakers who are trying to shovel the ocean with a fork and, and they just get tired and we can't, and everybody's always willing to say, oh, you should have done this or you should have done that. But very few people say, hey, I see you're having trouble with this, or I'd like us to start doing that. What can I do to make that happen? You know, people just don't, because people want you to do stuff for them. You know, we're basically selfish, introspective individuals, you know, and, and that's just the way it works. And, but when, if you can break a job up and say, you know, it's like the March of Dimes, you know, you don't say, give me a hundred dollars. You get a hundred dollars, you get a hundred people to, you know, or a thousand people to give you a dime. And, and that's, you know, you solve the problem and people aren't resentful of the amount of time. And I think part of the burnout is people get resentful of the amount of time that they commit to this and the fact that, and I'm like that myself. I mean, every year I sit down and read the bills and then I go into the internet and get my, get my information that I'm going to use to counter some of the wacky ass claims that people make. And then I write up my testimony and, you know, and, and then I have to make my three minute summary that I'm going to give orally of, of what's going on. And I have to be prepared in case they ask me questions. And I, year after year after year, I've been doing this now. I mean, not as long as you have, but I think this is my fourth or fifth year doing this. And, you know, I get the same stupid questions and the same idiotic comments from, from the people in the judiciary committee. It, it just, it's like, you know, when, when, when I told you three years ago and then I told you two years ago and I told you last year and the same thing, didn't you ever look any of that stuff up? Don't you care, you know, uh, uh, about the, 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 the misinformation that's going on around out there? And it does get kind of frustrating. But again, that's the kind of stuff where, you know, all they got to do, those guys with the big money, all they got to do is wave their little magic wand and there's 500 letters that come in you know, uh, uh, you're saying, yeah, you know, take these guys rights away. And, and we have to kill ourselves to get, you know, 50 people to show up at a meeting. It's just crazy. Okay. But so the, oh, let me, let, let me finish. Yeah. Then I'm going to interrupt you. Or, I mean, no, go but, ahead and but, finish. But, but the object of the game is if you can make it manageable, if you can make it a manageable chunk, how many people have the time to sit for eight or 10 hours? hours on a work day to get three minutes to speak. I mean, most people just don't have that kind of time. Right. In and, other words, to, to prep for eight hours so that you can travel somewhere, wait in line, eventually maybe get pulled up to the microphone so that you get that three minutes. That's a heck of a lot of prep for a potential three minutes and how effective can that three minutes be and keeping the motivation to understand that it's critical. If you didn't do that, you know, then we'd be in a whole different world. But um, all right, so you brought up all kinds of awesome stuff. So if you're down, I'm going to dig in a couple of different ways. I'm going to go backwards, I think, just because it's, I don't know, it's the last thing you mentioned there, um, is something that, and I know you aren't, and that's the best thing about having you on. Thanks for jumping in. Um, sometimes I talk to people who are satisfied with shaking their fist at the sky and, and you know, 
enunciating very well why they're shaking their fist at the cloud, but they're frustrated with the cloud and they're not, you know, doing anything useful or practical. I know you're not like that. And you, you actually do stuff that's uh, practical and useful. And, and you're also, it seems like, willing to adapt and learn. And, you know, you're not set in your ways. And, you know, this was useful 17 years ago. So that's why I do it continue, you know, today. But um, with all that said, um, in an effort to uh, illustrate, I guess, the, 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 the facts, and I don't know any other way to say that. It's probably a bad way to say it. But in, a, in a, some way to, to illustrate in, a, in an infographic or in some kind of a, a visual way, um, the time frames of advocacy. And I'm thinking of, you know, when I start hearing people get frustrated and quit, I go, oh, what did they get frustrated for? What did, what was their expectation? Was it realistic? You know, did they just expect to come to the table, say something verbose and brilliant, pound their fist on the table and walk away and now we'd have no NFA, right? That would be the extreme, like crazy, you know, expectation of time frame. But on the other hand, things don't take forever either. And, and over the years, we've had like waves of different types of attack against second amendment protected rights. And at one point it was through hunting and that's where we see the con conservance, cons conservation, whatever you call it, conservancy efforts of hunting. That wasn't always there. P hunters weren't just always altruistic, give a shit about the environment. There were a bunch of dicks like plowing through it like everybody else until they became aware that either their self-interest, like you're going to lose your hunting grounds or you're going to lose your, critters like you have to manage these things there's more of us there's more demand than there are critters in most places so you know hunters became aware of that and again they wanted to continue hunting so they did things to change and one of those uh, things that they did one of the acts that they did to protect themselves in the second amendment at the same time uh, was the orange campaign going to the orange hunters orange vests and stuff and that was i think and I don't, I'm not a big FUD, I don't care that much, but you know, through my research or whatever, from what I understand, that was to combat or to battle the perception that hunters are out there just slaughtering each other because we're all a bunch of idiots shooting each other. You know, when you've got more people, what do they say whenever Wisconsin goes hunting, it's more than the entire military. You know, there's a lot of people out there hunting and they, most of these people are hunting recreationally. They're not like avid hunters that spend all off season hours worrying about hunting and you know perfecting their skills. Most of these people are hunting in places where there's soybean fields and you know corn fields. So all they gotta do is go stand next to or stand up in a tree next to a field and wait for the fattest deer to go by and shoot down at it. It's not like they're hunting so much as they're you know population control and, and harvesting and grabbing real food instead of factory meat. But all that said, the the, the the perception was being portrayed that, you know, hunters are a bunch of drunks that go out and kill each other. And we need to regulate that. We need to get rid of these guns that they play with. And the way that one of the ways that the industry or whatever the community dealt with that was create the whole Hunter's Orange campaign. And now Hunter's Orange is a thing. I don't think anybody even thinks twice about where that comes from. But that was a deliberate effort. I don't want to say NSF, but it might have been NSF, but it was somebody like the NSF, you know, some organization of multiple interested parties from different areas of the things that hunting affected, all said, hey, we don't want to let them push us around, so let's do something proactively. And that took some time. That's what I guess I'm getting at, that time frame of act advocacy. Somebody thought of that. Somebody said, hey, there's orange and blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, I guess now we have the technology to make orange stuff, you know, paint orange onto things or sew things in orange. So what if we all just wore orange like the guys on the highway and, you know, boom, boom, boom. And now we're in the point, you know, where it's a household word. What was that time frame? If that, that wasn't 15 minutes, you know, that wasn't 15 weeks. That might've been 15 years. And if that's the case and we look at some of the things that they're doing and we understand that, okay, you know, it takes so much time or something. Maybe is there a way to, I guess, the long way to get into this, is there some way to, look back at, or is it valid? Is it worth taking the time to go back and look at how long some of these uh, advocacy projects took so that we don't have unrealistic expectations? You know, we get upset because what we're doing, you know, for four years ain't working or what we're doing for 14 years ain't working. But if the normal time frame is 20 years. 
Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. It doesn't work that way in Connecticut because in Connecticut, you have to wear a uh, blaze orange by law. So they actually just passed a law and said, you will wear this stuff. Oh, no, no, but, but, no, but that all started from like the 70s when right, they yeah. first created and, all that. And, and, but, yeah. and, you know, and originally hunters were really against it because they didn't understand that deer and shit were colorblind. Yeah, nor, back in the day, everybody wore red when they were hunting, and that was like your safety. I'm wearing yeah. red, plaid, or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think... But I'm uh, just using that as an example. There's been other things, maybe the Heller, like whenever they decided, let's do Heller, and then Heller is in the Supreme Court. If that was like a two-year thing, if that was a 20-year thing, that gives us a perspective on our advocacy measures, right? I guess it's not 100% because we should expect things to get faster and faster with understanding and, you know knowledge of whatever's come before but then also technology is going to change yeah and, and and let's face it it is disappointing you know i mean you only live so long <laughs> you know and you don't want to spend half your life uh fighting for the rights by the and then by the time you get them you're too old to exercise them i i think uh our, we have a guy here uh senator joe markley and he's he has won the uh the ccdl award for you know most uh effective legislator uh, he won that many years in a row and he, he likens it to a football game. And he says, you know, it's really tough being on that, on that, on that line. And, and they're trying to, to, to pass the ball and, and, and make it happen. And your whole job is just to stop them from getting over the goal post, you know, to stop them from getting that first down, even though there's an infinite number of downs, it's your job to stop them from getting the goal because once they pass a piece of legislation, it's almost impossible to get rid of it again after that. So his thing is, yeah, it's, it's really frustrating to get out there and be on that, you know, be the center and, and all that stuff and, and get your brains beat out, you know, by these guys rushing, rushing, rushing. They're always rushing you and always trying to, to gain ground on you. But it's easier to stop them, you know, it's, it's easier to deal with them bef before they make the goal than they are after, because then you're just playing catch up. You know, you're trying to, okay, now how do we get rid of this? Well, it's too late. It's already out there. And he, he mentioned that the, uh, he actually sent out a, uh, a video the other day talking about the new legislative session that's coming up. And that was one of the things he said, he says, I know you guys are frustrated. And, you know, even our, even our legislators that are with us understand how deep our frustration runs. And he says, but you got to remember, you've got to stop them from getting that first down as often as possible and, and, you know, make them punt into the next legislative session. And that's basically what we do, right? I mean, we don't win. We're just fighting this delaying tactic that forces them to punt the ball into the next legislative session. And the next legislative session, they start all over again. And, and, and it's, it's a real pain in the butt. And, mm -hmm. and that's, and that's going to continue until the courts stop allowing them to, to have these unconstitutional laws. That's a, and, and the, the way that you describe that, they also get an advantage because as soon as they wear out a, an initiative or a team or a, you know, an effort, they just can, okay, whatever. They hire some other people who are starting fresh and we don't get to just hire people that are starting fresh that are, you know, still a hundred percent dedicated to the rights that are protected by it all there, you know, on that side, they probably are delusional or never thought about it or don't under never put two and two together. So, Hey, pay us a hundred thousand dollars to get rid of guns. Sure. What do we care? You know, we don't shoot guns. And, uh, and then once they get frustrated or figure out maybe, you know, that our, our persistence educates them and they go, Hey, this isn't a fight. It's not worth a hundred thousand dollars to fight against our own. Uh, you know, I, I agree that they draw from, you know, to continue the analogy, their bench is unlimited on rights. You know, they, they, they have, and, and, you know, they got, you know, moms demand attention and, and, you know, black lives matter and all this. And, and like, I, I think if I understand where you're going, they can just change the spin and get another whole group of fresh bodies yelling and screaming and attacking the line. Yeah. Whereas or, like, we are the same people all the time. It's the same people defending over and over and over again. Yeah. And we never, well, there's a couple of things we're going to dig into here, but yeah, exactly. That's definitely a dynamic that uh, 
that's why I'm glad we're talking today because I'd rather look at it from that angle than all the ways we're losing. Uh, but let me get into this one. And this is an interesting one. I had Charles Heller on was it earlier this week. One day I invited like 40 something people. And he's the only person that jumped in. So it was just him and I. And uh, that got me a chance to chat with him because I don't really get to chat with Charles too often. He gets really distracted when we're you know, at places and he doesn't like to just sit there bullshit. And so it's rare that I get a chance to like really chat with him one on one. So I gave him my analogy that I probably have told you about, you know, coordinating a bunch of people mowing lawns so that you can create a bigger project, you know, with the whole, uh, you know, taking a drone up in the air and watching a bunch of lawns get cut. Anyway, so I, I haven't heard it. So go ahead. Oh, okay. So I gave him this analogy. I'll tell you later. But it basically, I gave him this analogy that takes too long to explain quickly. And then his reaction was that, you know, it takes too long. There's anyway. I was asking him a couple of things, and, um, and and I forget what it was exactly, but it made me think of another conversation I'd had with someone at the gun rights policy conference, and um, it might be Jeff Knox. And uh, Jeff said something to the effect of, you know, if someone's a um, lobbyist, then, you know, every solution they're going to come up with is going to be you know, like everyone. Everybody thinks their solutions are the best, but everybody's solution is going to be centric to whatever it is they're into. So if they're politicians or excuse me, if they're lobbyists, they're gonna, they're, their solutions to pretty much everything is going to be, you know, increasing lobbying efforts. And, you know, their arguments are going to be lobbying is better than um, uh, uh, courts because like you just said, all the points you just said, and that's what made me go back to this. So I thought that was, that was point. Nobody ever brought that up before, but it's the same kind of thing with the hammer. Everything looks like a nail. So if you're, if you're centric to lobbying or if you're centric to uh, court cases, you know, you're a, a law scholar and you do those merit, meritus, whatever those things are called, and you're all about the courts, then you'd probably be okay with letting things slip all the way to where they have to go to the courts. And you'd pay most of your attention focusing on the, the, the cases that are on their way up to the courts. And then you'd be butthurt and justified by all the court decisions. But, you know, centric to courts, that's great, but it's not all we got. And I guess um, if that makes sense that there's different groups out there that have this different like perspective on the fight. Um, when I was talking to Charles, the way he described something or answered a question to me, um, it made me think, you know what? Charles is an organization centric one. And and I I, I knew that and I never had a way to, to, to say it, but uh, I think that's the way to say it. Um, so Charles is um, one of the founding members of the Arizona Citizens Defense League. Uh, we mentioned them earlier, and those are the people, the four guys that got thousands of people together uh, to push bills that they wrote uh, up through the state here uh, to, to take basically take an eraser to our state constitution and create constitutional carry. They just erase a bunch of stuff that said with a permit, which basically created constitutional carry. It just meant that anyone who's able to own a gun could now was not prohibited by any state level law from carrying a gun. So all there was was the federal stuff about prisons and nuclear power plants, you know, the, the, the federal level prohibition. Right, right. So um, Arizona Citizens Defense League has done awesome stuff. And Charles was a critical, you know, founding member. He's also been integral in a couple of other uh, national level organizations. And, you know, he's part of the Gun Rights Policy Conference for probably more than a decade now. Um, so he's definitely into the organizations, aware of their successes and what they've done. And I'm all about organizations, but at the same time, that's not all we've got. It's not our only resources. And um, and that's one of the things I think with Every Second Matters that, again, I never had a way to enunciate it or say it, but that was one of the reasons for Every Second Matters was to um, be aware of what the organizations are doing and enhance whatever they're doing when possible, but not rely on and not idolize and not basically depend on because they're a flaky resource. And while they can be really effective sometimes, you know, VCDL, I don't want to put a black eye on it, but I'm also not going to talk about stuff that, you know, can be used against us. That guy's an idiot. He went on that one guy's show and with the kids and all that, he got like buffooned or whatever they call it, lampooned, whatever, where that comedian guy uh, took him for a ride and, and publicly mocked the shit out of him. He was, I was surprised he's even their, their figurehead anymore. So, um, you know, I'm down that if he wants to continue on, go for it. He, you know, he's got whatever the, uh, 
you know, he's done a, a, quite a bit of stuff. He should have everybody's respect. That was one error in judgment, but it was a doozy. So, um, you know, that's all I'm getting at is that, you know, we have these organizations, none of them are infallible. And all it takes is literally for some of them, their email server to break. And then they just are going to be worthless because they don't know how to use Gmail or, you know, some, some little tiny thing could cause a clog. And then we're missing an organization or like you say, the driving member of it misses. So that's where I guess what I'm getting at is, is that is, and I don't even know if I'm saying anything other than to illustrate. I don't know if I'm asking a question, I'm kind of ghosting you here, but I'll just shut up because I've been talking for like an hour. Um, but that idea that some people are looking at this as like a lobbying thing. Some people look at it as it's, it's, we got, it's all about the courts. Some people are looking at this, like the organizations will save us, you know, and look at the NRA, like organizations don't save us. I mean, they can help, but nothing should be relied upon. Right. I think it's all going back to the, we're individuals, we're mowing the lawn and it might be nice to have a campaign that pats you on the back for mowing your lawn, but just deal with it. We're all mowing our lawn forever. Well, I, I, well, let me unpack a little bit of that. So I, I agree that each of these, it's like, it's like the dikes around a river. You know, you don't put just one berm up and say, well, that's it. You know, if the river overflows, we're good. You know, you have, you have your first line of defense, your second line of defense, your third line of defense, and you have, you have the, the, the causeways that divert the water and you have the stuff that's supposed to just stop the water. And then you have the, you know, and, and the, the lobbying is good. Lobbying is better for getting new legislation than it typically is for stopping uh, legislation that's on the move. But it's still the object of the game is you're getting into it early and you're, it's damage control because if you can stop that bill from even getting into a committee or get it killed in a committee, you're done. You know, you've punted the ball to the next legislative session. They have to reintroduce it. Well, and so, I believe that you've also kind of, it's like when you, when you take a puppy and you shoe their nose after they peed in the house or something, it's like letting them know, nope, 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 like, nope. You're letting the, the political strategists, the politicians themselves know that we're not, you know, this isn't even something that's so debatable that it's getting through, like, nope. Well, you, you would you would think so, except that these are not rational people. The the, pe well, the gun, gun control individual. people are not rational people. They don't they never believe that they don't have a chance to get that through again. That's why they keep putting it on the table. Well, it's, not, it's a it's a it's a state of mind or whatever. It's a mind. It's a thought. It's not an individual because they definitely don't have the same people every time. But they'll always have that on the agenda. It's it's just a thing that some people's way of thinking right goes on and on. They don't even need to recruit. In other words, it's just a either grow up having no opinion or you like them or you hate them. And the people that hate them are just going to be on that side no matter what, right? They don't even need justification. They're just going to hate Well, them. I mean, you're familiar with the trope that there's a bunch of anti-gun bills just sitting on the shelf. And as soon as a disaster happens or a major shooting happens, they grab it off the shelf, they blow the dust off and they introduce it. Of course. Yeah, definitely. And, and it, and it's because they, they honestly don't understand that this stuff is, unconstitutional and it's affecting people's rights and they shouldn't be doing stuff like this. And because they think they're right all the time and, and because they think they have the moral high ground, even though, you know, we, if you put the facts in front of them, they just collapse and start calling you bad names and then they get you fired from your job. Uh, you know, that's, that's, you need to be able to fight against stuff like that. And, the lobbyist part is great in, you know, stopping it from getting to committee, killing it in committee, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's, but, but that's just one part of the, of the dike to keep that stuff from those gun bills from washing over you. And, and then the second part is your activism when it's in committee you know, and, and when, when the laws are being proposed and getting the, the letter writing campaigns and doing the rallies, which I personally think rallies are a waste of time, but that's okay. Um, and, 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 you know, going and giving testimony and getting expert witnesses to testify and stuff like that, you know, that's the next level. And again, you're trying to contain that, not even let it get out of committee. Um, 
uh, or even, which is even better, is if you can show the need to have to send it to another committee, like, hey, that's a great bill, but who's done the budget analysis to show how many more cops we're going to need, how many more Knicks checkers we're going to need, how many more this, that, you know, how many more uh, people, you know, like, like the guy uh, trying to get the money because we know we're going to be putting people in prison, you know, that kind of thing. So now you have to send it to a budget committee. And there's another delaying tactic that you can use to try to keep them from getting that first down, you know, from getting that thing over the line. Well, the um, whole accountability, what's it like financial, what's the word, like the accounting fin responsibility or the financial accountability or what is the word for that, where they have to show that they can pay for it before they can even offer it. Well, that's not a requirement, but the, the, that, that way to challenge their suggestion, Hey, we need to do this. Like you say, let's, let's talk about how you pay for that. I think that's a valid, um, what's the code that's a response to their BS because so often, yeah, they'll say blah, blah, blah. And everybody might think, Oh yeah, that sounds great. But yeah, you don't think about the infrastructure that's required for all that. And uh, often you can contrast the cost and the overhead and the, well, we would look at the lack of rights or the loss of rights or something or the overstep of government, um, depending on your view of government, that may or may not be a big issue for you, but all of that combined though, and then compare that or contrast that, I guess, to the potential benefit or the potential gain. And they often look at just the lives and stuff, I guess, because of brevity, they have to do it quickly, but you know, when you're lobbying, there's the lobbying you do in the room, and then there's the lobbying you do to the public that gets them motivated to call the people in that room so that they, you know, put more credence to that lobbying that happens in the room. Um, and then, I guess, awareness of all those levels of it. Yeah, that's all super valid. Um, so, unless you want to throw something back at that, um, when, you, when you were talking about that, something that came up as I was thinking about that is, with these different things, when you've got an organization, for example, the consequences of that or the or the the the, the well, whatever the, the results of that are that you have a membership, that you have meetings or that you have, uh, you know, something tangible perhaps comes out of the fact that you have an organization of a bunch of people. You know, new laws get enacted, uh, people show up at places or you know, some things get signed or something or awareness happens. So um, if you've got uh, the uh, stuff that happens like the in the courts, again, you have a result, you have a, an argument and then you have a debate and then you have a result. But with lobbying, it's one of those open-ended. So how do you get accountability for lobbying? I mean, I guess you have a result, like you say, like things either proceed or they don't proceed. But it just seems like the, the, my other frustration, I think, with lobbying, or I think a lot of people's frustration with lobbying, is perhaps that you can throw, you know, it's like a bucket. You can just throw funds and resources at a lobbyist. And, you know, what are they going to say? Like, I needed to, you know, be at this event, or I needed to, to schmooze the guy here, or I needed to be in this vacation place because I needed to talk to the guy when his guard was down while he was swimming. You know, like, it, at some point, it's tough, I think, to, to know that lobbying is... Uh, you know, you throw 50 bucks at it and you get a result. Not that it should be, but that's one of those. I don't know if that's an aspect or not. Well, the, so, so let me say, let me say a couple things about lobbying. So yes, lob, lobbyists are like boats. There are big holes in the water into which you throw money. But, uh, but the, the truth of the matter is here in Connecticut, we actually had uh, last year, there was a proposal to establish a, a, an actual paid position that local gun clubs would all contribute to, to have a paid lobbyist at the Capitol. Because one of the things we realized is the other side has tons of them. They've got tons of these paid lobbyists, you know, the Bloomberg guys and all that. And they are eating our lunch because we don't have anybody in the fight. And that was another thing that, that they asked. And, and basically what they did was they, and CC, it wasn't CCDL, but they were involved in it. Um, some, some other group came together and said, Hey, what do you think? And they came and canvassed the different, uh, the different organizations and said stuff like, are you willing to give us 
if if we decide to pull the trigger on this, are you willing to commit a dollar per member as your yearly con your contribution? Just give us a dollar per person you have in your organization, and we'll use that money to hire a lobbyist full time. And I'll tell you what, you know, they came to our board and they made the pitch, and we said, well, you know. It sounds like a good idea. Of course, we're all old, cheap white guys. We don't want to spend any money. But uh, but we brought it to the members, and the members said, yeah, you betcha. This is a good idea. So on the one hand, lobbying is kind of tough because it's intangible, and it's not like you're bribing them. See, most people lobby and bribe are kind of like the same word in the dictionary or something. But uh, but the but the truth of the matter is you're trying to get in front of people with an opposing point of view and with opposing evidence. And that's what lobbying is all about. Lobbying is, is getting your point of view and trying to get your evidence into the hands of people that are either shielded from it or not aware of it. And and that's a good thing. You want to be able to do stuff like that. Um, so. You know, I, I thought that was another good thing that they were talking about uh, last year. Now, no one ever came back to us and said, okay, we did it. You know, here's, it's time for you to pony up your first, uh, your first payment. But I, th I think maybe as we get closer to the spring, uh, it may come around. It's too, it's almost too late now because we need, you know, it's, like I said, the, the, uh, the legislative session is going to start on the 5th of September. Um, you know, do we really need the lobby guys talking to these guys like right now? But uh, but uh, I think it's a good thing. You know, I, I think lobbying is a good thing. I think it has its place, you, but you don't want to bet the ranch on it. Just like you said with the organizations, you don't want to bet the ranch. What's the purpose of organizations like VCDL and CCDL? It's to mobilize a group of people. And, and when you have situations where you need a group of people mobilized, like you're going to have a rally, you're going to do a letter writing campaign, you're going to do a, a, a meet your uh, meet your senator, meet your congressman, lunch type of thing. You're going to a, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon on a, on a Thursday, which is when they always do this shit. We're going to have a meeting to talk about gun control. Right. And, and of course they do it that way because all the, all the regular conservative people have jobs and they can't get there. Well, your job is to have an organization that has people like me that are retired that can show up at places like that and make a stand. And, and you do depend on those organizations for that kind of thing, but you don't depend on organizations to do lobbying because they're not good at it. Lobby, you know, lobbying is kind of a mono on mono kind of thing. And, and it requires a lot of desk work, a lot of prep and all that kind of stuff. So you pay people to do that again, multiple, you know, you don't just have the, you don't just have the one barricade next to the river and say, well, this is it. If the river overflows, that's going to take care of it. I agree. Um, we're not really getting many comments, so I'm just going to go back into uh, my uh, internal notes here as we've been chatting. I've been stopping from interrupting you all the time to uh, I've just been leaving notes or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think we've taken it in some interesting directions. Um, somewhere in there, you had said something, and it got me to think about how nowadays there's a... Um, the kids these days have set up some sort of an awards to clap themselves on the back and and try to uh sell merchandise and uh to recognize a bunch of youtubers and you know me i'm not i mean i use youtube or whatever but i'm, I'm trying not to be youtube centric there's a heck of a lot of ways to communicate out there using the internet and the on-demand uh, uh production of materials that we have you know all the different ways you can create things nowadays and get it distributed Amazon and stuff it's amazing so um, there's there's ways that um, uh, the people can uh, get the word out there and where the hell was I going with this uh, there's the I don't want to call it I'm trying to, to allude to it without being a dick but there's this awards thing where there's going on right now I'll just leave it at that um, I think going into 2020 we have uh, um, uh, it would be cool to have an awards thing for uh, Second Amendment advocacy. Uh, we have something at the Gun Rights Policy Conference where they give out some kind of little pieces of glass that are engraved. But, for example, they gave out uh, the blog of the year to Charlie Cook for doing his 
Riding Shotgun with Charlie uh, video series. And, okay, that's what they can do whatever they want. But I'm thinking uh, it'd be interesting to have a not so much tangible, because I don't know, I'm not, whatever, we can make something maybe on the robot or something, but um, something inexpensive, the, the, the thing isn't the, the concept, but just some way to acknowledge some of the individuals out there, some of the um, the organizations and the, uh, the, as you were talking about lobbyists too, I was just thinking that lobbying is one of those things that, that you almost have to do as an individual. And that's going to be, it's going to, like you say, re, it's going to end up um, not requiring, but it's going to mean you, you kind of have to depend on if you've got a, somebody who's a good lobbyist and that's going to depend on the person that they're dealing with because you could be great at lobbying but the person you're dealing with the person who's tasked with you have to change their mind you're, you clash with then who cares how good of a lobbyist you are if you don't work with that person so it's going to be sort of a stars lining up thing sometimes for lobbying but when they do line up you'd want to have and i think today we could have you know ways of acknowledging and um well, I guess acknowledging, you know, voting resources, too, is part of it, I guess, too. But um, anyway, maybe there's some way to do something in 2020 where we acknowledge the uh, Second Amendment side of stuff uh, with some sort of, uh, I don't know, recognition, I guess. Yeah, those kinds of things, they tend to revolve around a centralized organization, though. You know, you have... Yeah. You, you have... Uh, like the Second Amendment Foundation, like for instance, the CCTL has Legislator of the Year every year, and they and they give the guy a plaque and they bring him in to to one of our meetings, and we all stand up and give him a standing ovation, and and they also announce his name at the dinners, and a lot of times previous award winners will will also get mentioned, and so you know basically we're just trying to tell the the legislators, hey, we really appreciate the work you did. But in order to do that, we needed, you know, you needed a centralized organization. It's not like a grassroots thing because you, you need, you know, you need people to, su to submit suggestions. Uh, you know, why, why do I think this guy should get the, the award? And then you need someone to, to decide all that stuff and actually, you know, award the award, if it were. I hear you. And that's, again, I, I hear you. Then I, and that's why I guess, uh, as I was saying it too, I was thinking of some of that stuff and uh, some of that stuff isn't necessary and would be annoying. Maybe there's something with a hashtag or just some some uh, system that we could come up with or whatever the word is, like just some uh, tradition that we could come up with to acknowledge people. And again, as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, maybe you're having like a wiki, like a version of a two-way Wikipedia that just tracks everybody and somebody could acknowledge someone's effort by adding them to the Wikipedia, the same way Wikipedia works, I think, right? Like if someone says, hey, there's somebody doing something, I'm, they're not in here yet, I'm gonna put them in here. The fact that they're in there is some acknowledgement and then maybe having a comment thing or a, rec what's the word, a, um, a reputation score or something, some sort of, a, you know, likes or whatever kind of a thing where the people can, you know, give them a comment and, uh, like a review, like an Amazon review, and then uh, let people know, like, hey, this is somebody that did something, you know, in New Jersey, or this is somebody that did something for suppressors or whatever. But again, that would definitely uh, be dependent on whoever creates it or the organization that puts it together and posts it or whatever. But uh, maybe something like I say, a hashtag type of, I don't know what the word is, tradition could be set up where people just, uh, you know, acknowledge, hey, this is to a advocacy worthy or something. Yeah, well, I've seen the guys. Uh, uh, I can't remember the guy's uh, channel name. It's the ones that do the little short, uh, uh, the gun collective, right? I've seen, I mean, those are mostly, you know, shilling guns and stuff, but but they do something like that. You know, they, they have a, they have like a YouTuber of the month or that kind of thing that they do. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing I could see where if you got, a few of the really big channels, you know, like Yankee and Tim and, and, you know, military arms and, 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 uh, those guys together and said, we're going to, we're going to hold a, you know, we're, we're going to do the advocacy award this year and we want you to nominate people, you know, that'd be great. But, you know, it's, again, you need an organization at the top to, to put that together and one that has a fairly wide reach, you know, so you can let people know, 
you know, uh, on a, on a wide scale, Hey, we're doing this, you know, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, put this thing together, you know, and the guy wins a, you know, uh, you know, a, a gun or something. I don't know, whatever, you know, yeah, I don't care about that part of it. And like I say, I don't give a shit about, there's no, if you ask YouTube who the advocates are, you're going to get four answers. So, um, yeah, I'm thinking more of maybe a, a campaign slash, you know, I don't know what to keep. I keep calling it a tradition. Whatever you call the, you know, the, whatever you, your attempt to create a tradition, I suspect, you know, whatever the word is for that, um, you know, that type of effort. Um, but with that in mind, uh, hmm. we've been going for about an hour, and we've been kind of digging into some nerdy stuff. So I'm going to screen share again, and that'll bring us back to my giant wide monitor over here. Don't be scared. Oops, I pulled it from there, and now it is the entire screen. So over here on the right, you're seeing behind the scenes here. This is the chat going on over there. See Pants out there. Bishop Woods. Phil Klein is out there. Misha and Ghost and Lockjaw. I think it's everybody. So thanks for jumping in. There's only nine people watching. We're getting corked right now. Um, but I got some two advocates uh, over here. So this is just the authors. I got... Uh, as I dig in, this is sort of my notes, a growing um, list, and I put it in a database, I guess, so that it's, uh, you know, can be expanded and so that you get stuff like this. So you can click on something like female and get all the females in here. Or you could click on people that were at Amcon, for example. So there's, that's not a reason I really put it in a database, but if I go back to those authors, I get my damn thing to work, my authors, um, you can see I haven't cartooned everybody yet. That'll take a while. But uh, I figured I'd just dig in here a little bit. And uh, this is the stuff that I'm going to transition into. So I'm not going to worry about trying to get people to be advocates anymore. That's everybody else's responsibility now. Uh, but I'm just going to continue to create resources. And uh, uh, I keep finding them. So when I talk about uh, being frustrated with YouTube, again, if you were to ask the YouTube audience, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think if you were to ask the YouTube audience, uh, not our audience, but just people that watch YouTube, uh, who our 2A activists are, um, I don't think you get many, much alteration or what's the word, what, much uh, change, much more than the five or six you could think of off the top of your head. And then people have to stretch a little bit. And this is just the authors. And I guess authors is a little obscure, but uh, if we go to bloggers, uh, this is all the people that the Gun Rights Policy Conference, the Second Amendment Foundation decided didn't weren't worthy of getting a thing for their blogs that they give one to Charlie. I got no problem with Charlie, but he's doing video. He's doing an interview. He's not doing a blog. And we've got, well, maybe I'm biased, but I've got five females over here and then three males and they're all alive. They're all still kicking. And as far as I know, they're all still blogging. So um, there's a heck of a lot of other people out there. So anyway, I figured I would just dig around into here and, uh, some of this stuff will never get the light of day. Like, you know, people just aren't going to be interested in 2A authors all that often. Um, but when they are, hopefully it'll give them some some help finding some of that stuff out there. Also, uh, let's see. I'm going to have to leave this one open. I don't have to leave it open, but I am leaving it open so I can read it. Um, well, see, that that's the kind of thing where you would have... If you really wanted to do a, a nice job at that, you'd have categories. So people weren't, so a blogger wasn't competing against an author and an author wasn't competing against a video producer. You know what I mean? So it, it'd be more like the, you know, the Emmys or the Oscars where you, where you have categories and you say, and, and the, the most uh, influence, it, and it's actually, you're talking about the influencers, right? Who are the big influencers of, you know, 2019, say, so because now you'd be doing it for last year. And, and you know, you would say, okay, well, the, the guy that wrote the book that was the most, that made the biggest splash two-way wise was, you know, John Lott or somebody, you know, I, I just right. need you pull a name out of my hat. And, and uh, uh, you know, somebody else might say, well, the guy that had the biggest uh, online show was uh, Joe Rogan, you know, right. <laughs> and, and that way, you know, people that are, that are, are, 
you know, if you could categorize it up a little bit, I think it would be fairer. It would it would make more sense. And and you know, people could submit multiple multiple persons. Uh, you know, on a uh, uh, could submit multiple people in different category. We could probably. I haven't done anything like this in a while, but um, back in the day, if you wanted to collect a bunch of stuff, you could hashtag it or add it or something. You know, do some kind of a thing that could be searchable and found, and uh, and then just call it over. And you wouldn't need nothing more than the concept of it and spread that concept around. And then it could be multi-platform. I would think you could have one one page on the site somewhere that just collects it goes out and pulls through apis you know pull me all the hashtag to a advocacy blah 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 or you know some little code in the hashtag system and then it could just display them all or maybe pull them all and then do an additional filter based on something pull them all and then let your site uh create little voting things you can upvote and downvote you know there's all those kind of things where you just give them a running tab on a database and you know the hot or not type of thing so you could just let people nominate by putting a hashtag on any platform pull everything with that hashtag over do whatever appropriate filter and then let people hot or not thumb it up or thumb it down and that would rank everybody and then you'd you know you that would be kind of neat but anyway we're getting off in that but that's true here uh right the um what i'm doing as a single site i have a a, you know, a slot, let's say a, a piece of data like George Wingate, one of the guys that created the uh, NRA back in the olden days. And I might give him an attribute of, you know, he's a general, so he's probably in the army. Uh, give him the attribute of NRA, give him the attribute of author. I think he wrote a book and then sports. I think he might have been the guy that created some s s school sports organization or something. So that's the kind of stuff that would show up over here. So under author, because he's got that attribute author, you know, he should show up over here. Um, that's just kind of the way I built this. I have so many and I have to structure them in such a way, but there are other ways to accumulate data. For example, like YouTube or Google, they don't you know, have any control over all the websites they archive, but they still manage to archive all the websites out there. So it is possible to create some sort of a, a thing that creates an entry into some sort of a pool, like you're saying, based off of different categories that, you know, unlike mine, where I give them whatever categories I gave them. If I gave them six categories, that's all they ever get is six categories. You could create a system that the categories are created by the people participating. So the categories could become very, you know, subtle or diverse or nuanced. All right, well, that's talking about what we're going to add in the concept of recognition or, you know, just kind of touching on the idea of uh, offering some sort of um, thank you to the people out there, the individuals out there doing advocacy and stuff. Um, one of the things I started the show with, I've been working on this thing with the museums. And yesterday I was, showed you a little bit about the video I was working I've been working on, still working on it. I wanted to put them in there chronologically. So I went through and resorted my visits to these museums uh, chronologically and that's what I think I was just chatting about when cycle first jumped in so as we end the show here I'll just go back and touch on this uh, the first as far as I know um, I think there was one in 1923 and I can't remember for the life of me which one that was but the, as far as I've in my whatever I've shed light on so far the earliest one I know of is that Fuller collection in Chick Chickamauga a Civil War battlefield by uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, then the Dayton Air Museum, the Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City, the Jonathan Browning Museum, which is in uh, Illinois. So John Browning's father, he had a gun shop. He created the harmonica gun, a little uh, derringer that has like a bunch of little barrels in a row. Uh, and that's where he invented that one in Illinois on the Mississippi River. We got the 45th Infantry Division Museum in Oklahoma City, a private collection that was donated to the 45th Infantry Division, and they've hosted it since 1968. We got the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame uh, in Waco, which has been there since 86. So look at that, from 68 to 86, no museums. Oh, no, I just mixed up. This is out of order. That's my bad. As I say, that's a long time for no museums. So they got, in real life, it went from 68 to 69 to J.M. Davis, so he... 
uh, had one of the largest collections, actually the largest collection, I guess, 12,000 firearms. Uh, gave that to the state of Oklahoma for a dollar, I think, as long as they would create a building and offer it to the world for free for 100 years, I think. Um, and then you got the Cody Museum started up in Wyoming. They're a bunch of jerks. Then you got the Wooden Labs uh, that's here in Arizona. Um, that's one of the guys I recently added to the um, list over here. I was at in uh, the Wooden. Then uh, Pima Air and Space Museum started in 1976, uh, which is kind of neat because uh, that's here in, Air in Tucson also. And it's now just about as big as the Dayton Air Museum, which is not small and it keeps getting bigger. I used to go to this one when I was a kid and I could probably, I could walk the dog over here tomorrow if I wanted to. Um, the John Browning Museum started up in 1978. Then you got the Boot Hill Museum, same year. Dragon Man started his in 1982, and he's got 3,000 firearms. So if you look at the numbers of firearms, you got the J.M. Davis at 12,000. You've got the Shitty Cody Museum at 7,000, hoarding them. They don't even show them all. Then you've got Dragon Man at 3,000. He's as big as the National at the NRA Museum down in Virginia. So he's pretty awesome. He started that in 1982, and he just posted a video on Instagram today. He bought so much new stuff. He's got a Civil War section now. He's blowing out walls and, and growing all the time. And now, I don't know, somebody gave him some idea to do some live stuff. And now he's uh, going live with his uh, kind of, I don't know, 20-minute long tours, like as he goes around and updates stuff. It's really neat seeing behind the scenes as he expands the tour. Uh, then you got the police museum in, uh, in L.A. So, again, that's one of these... Well, that's three years, I guess. Where was that one I had out of order? 86. So, no. What the hell? I had one of these. Oh, 86. So that 86 should have gone over here with the Titan. So we got Dragon Man. Then we would have had the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame at the same time, the Titan II. So Pima, uh, Pima Space Museum started in 1976. Basically, they were destroying all these planes, these World War II planes, and a couple of the generals were like, what the fuck are we doing? We're just destroying all the history. So they started sticking all the old planes, a sample of all the old planes out by the road. Uh, you know, it's a big fenced-in area. They would put them out by the road, and then it got to the point where people were, there was a thing to come look at these planes because it was amazing, right? They'd have all these old planes. This is literally where the Air Force would drag them all to destroy them. So um, they had a sample of all these different planes in 60-something. A bunch of generals said, this ain't working. Uh, let's do something. So the state gave the county a shit ton of BLM. Or the, count, the government gave the state a bunch of BLM land, who then gave it to the county, who then turned it into a non-military museum. So in 1976, it opened with 50 planes, and now it's up to 350. And they've got 360 acres out there. They only use like 40 of it or something right now. So it's going to be an amazing airplane, uh, airplane museum at some point. They've got the first B-52 bomber to ever come off the line. Uh, I think the last B-29 to ever fly. So it's they got some neat stuff there. Um, lots of neat story. So then in 80s, whenever it was, they decided to kill the Titans. One of the generals was like, hey, why don't we give one of the Titan bases the Titan II 9 megaton intercontinental ballistic missile uh, bases or silos to the museum. And everybody said, yeah, that sounds like an awesome idea. So they pulled the silo or the missile out of the silo and they decommissioned the, the, the warhead, obviously, the 9 megaton uh, uh, warhead, and then uh, popped a bunch of holes in it, left it up there for a month so that Russia could look at it from space, stuck it back in the, in the silo. And have opened it up, and until recently, you could go everywhere in it. Until just recently, they've stopped letting you walk around in it. Anyway, that opened in '86. Then you get the Autry Center of the West. That's a, it's an interesting museum, I guess. It's like a, it's a museum of the West. It ain't bad. It's not Indians. It's not cowboys. It's a little mix of everything. It's in right in the middle of L.A. It's at the, if you can watch Terminator when he comes out, when the naked Terminator comes out and steals everybody's leather coats and stuff. In the first Terminator, if you go down that hill, that's where this museum is. So it's right there at that zoo and the, at the astronomy observatory, I guess. So it's right underneath the Hollywood sign and everything. It's kind of a neat place to go. And it's a really, it's an okay museum. I don't think it's the best museum. I like the Oklahoma one better, but um, it's an okay museum. And I think it's expensive too. I think it's like 20 bucks. But anyway, the gun part is a private collection, like a lot of them. I think it was a vice president or something of Colt. 
uh, gave them all these guns, and it's some really neat guns. A bunch. It's all Colts, uh, so it's worth checking out for sure if you're a gun person. And it's just in a place that you wouldn't expect to see a really nice gun museum. And that started in 1988. Uh, then you got the National Firearms Museum moved to where it is in Virginia the same year. Uh, so that's the NRA's uh, museum that's open basically every single day. Then you've got uh, the Los Angeles Police Museum opened in 2001, a couple of years later. Another really neat museum. It's an old police station. Uh, so that's neat. You get to see the jails and all the stuff from like a police station from like the 20s or 30s or something. And uh, they got all kinds of cool police cars there. They got a helicopter and you can kind of just go the, like a little kid to go in the helicopter. And then uh, they've got the LA riot, uh, nothing from the riot. They've got the, uh, the AKs and stuff from those uh, Hollywood bank robber guys. Uh, then you got the Bannerman Castle started up in 2004. Uh, they got the Whittingham Center out here in New Mexico, started up in eight. The Dungup Museum was a private collection of a thousand guns that this guy's just collected over the years. Uh, there are guns that are dug up and stuff. It's totally free. That's in Cody. It's a way better museum than the shitty firearms museum over there. And then uh, the uh, Whittingham Museum in, or the National Museum of Sporting Arms in Missouri is the most recent one that I know of that started up in uh, 2013. Somewhere in there is the Gunfighters Hall of Fame uh, down in Tombstone, but that's really just a dude that won't answer any questions. So I don't know when he started his, but uh, that's the museums that I visited. And then the Spectrum, they started in the 50s and go up to 2013 is the last one they put together. I thought it was going to be shitty. I just barely saw that for the first time coming back from the 2A rally. It is one of my favorite museums now. I really, really like that one. So that's my uh, little spiel about them. I'll be doing some videos with, maybe I'll just take the audio from right there and turn that into the video. It'll save me some time. But uh, I don't know if anybody wants to chat about that. I, I'm surprised you don't have the uh, Gettysburg National Museum. Well, this isn't has... every museum. This is the ones that I visited on my tour. Oh, I see. Okay. So if I scroll down, it's being shitty. If I scroll down past a couple of pictures there, and I need to update my map, but these are more. So Gettysburg, yeah, I've got Colonial Williamsburg. Is there a different one? That's different. Yeah. Gettysburg, Gettysburg is, is uh, first War. opened in 1921. But that's Civil War. Yes. Uh, so... No, I don't. And here's the thing. When I was a little kid, we had campers. And, and during the summers, we would drive around and look at Civil War battlefields. And so I hate Civil War battlefields, kind of. I've seen every one of them, I think. I mean, I feel like I have. But um, I didn't put them in here just because there's a ton of them. But you're right. Um, and that's a pretty major one. I guess I should have it in here. Uh, what I started doing here is adding them as people mention them. So I'll just do that now. But um, I think I've driven right past it even. It's in West Virginia, right? Or is it in Pennsylvania? Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I don't recall. I, I, I think it's Pennsylvania. But I think I drove past another Civil War one in West Virginia one time, and I was like, dang it, if I'd been paying attention, I probably should have stopped at this one. Because they don't they forgot to have guns. I mean, there's Civil War battlefields. Right? Um, where the hell does it fit in here? No, I, I didn't realize it was just stuff you'd already been to. Oh, no, but I'm talking when I was a little kid, so I could definitely go to them again. I just didn't put them in my list because, like I say, I just, yeah. they're not on my radar. But uh, speaking of Civil War battlefields, have you been to them? Is that something you've ever done or been interested in? Or Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, that's actually one of the things I keep. It's on my bucket list to go back again because I didn't get it. Uh, we went there. We stopped one time. We were doing a motorcycle trip. And uh, we stopped there. We when we visited Monticello and a few other places, but we only got to spend a day or two in uh, in uh, Gettysburg, and I really enjoyed it. I was just fascinated at the um, how good the technology was back then. You know, uh, you know, uh, mortars with with uh, with self arming. Uh, you know, self-arming mortar rounds and, and claymores and, you know, stuff like that. It was just incredible that, that uh, I'm saying to myself, man, they had this stuff during the civil war. That's incredible. Well, and it's, that's one of those things that uh, one of my other projects, once I get past wherever my uh, Madman university is, whenever I get past some of this cartooning, the goal of having a bunch of cartoons is to start doing some timelines. 
because that's one of these things that I think is useful in the overall perspective or big picture, right? The bird's eye view that the Civil War was happening during the Industrial Revolution, kind of like it all fed on itself. And you're right, like some of that stuff was cool, but it couldn't have been bent. It couldn't have happened 20 years earlier because they couldn't have made it 20 years earlier. They were just figuring it out, some of that stuff, right? Some of the revolvers and stuff. Um, the Fuller Museum, that first one, I don't have very good pictures in here right now, I don't think. But uh, whenever this gets done, there'll be a bunch of pictures here from when I went there. Uh, they had a bunch of hand grenades, and they're all glass. Like, all the Civil War hand grenades were glass. They were just winging, basically, really wicked Molotov cocktails at each other. Yeah, their whole, their whole intent was just to injure as many piece of people as possible. Kind of like what we do with the 223. It was amazing stuff. You know, you see the, the pockmarks in the buildings and you got these guns that are like, you know, seven feet high, you know, that, that they use for long distance shooting and things. Yeah, in order to get accuracy because they couldn't they didn't figure it out rifling yet. Yep. Yep. Just My incredible. favorite was, uh, have you been to, I don't know where it is anymore. I don't remember it all anymore. But there's one where uh, they were at a stalemate and they got sick of it. And I'm pretty sure the north tunneled under the south. And they tunneled, they had a bunch of mine dudes, like dudes that had been, you know, their normal job was working in tunnels or creating tunnels for digging something out, coal or something. So uh, they were like, hey, you know what we can do? We can just dig a hole underneath of them and then fill it with dynamite, and light a wick and watch. And they cratered them. And I'm pretty sure it was the north did that to the south. You know the one I'm talking about? I, I'm not familiar with the battle, no, but it certainly sounds like something we would do. It was uh, unique enough that I can remember that one. And it you go there, and if I remember right, and again, I apologize because it's a long time ago, and they all bled together. And they definitely could have changed by now because it's a whole lifetime ago, really, that I went to them. But uh, if I remember right, that's one of the ones where they had rebuilt some of the, I don't know what you call, like where they put the wood back into the ground the way it would have been so that, it you know, like the sharp wood and stuff that would have prevented somebody from just running across over to your hill. And just seeing the size and scale of that stuff, for the amount of you know, because I'd been going to these things and I knew how long these battles were and all that. So anyway, it was they didn't re often recreate that stuff. They usually just left them and they were just melted hills of grass. Right? You couldn't see it was you'd have to imagine all the stuff that was there. So just seeing all that that was pretty neat. And then the crater was still there. I mean, it was a massive, massive crater. They basically, like I say, they just had two lines that they'd been shooting back and forth, like two trench lines. And then the one side said, "Hey, we could just dig a tunnel under them and blow them out of creation," and they did. So there's just this massive crater. So when you look at that, you know, hearing that is one thing. Standing at the side of this massive crater is like, wow, like these people did not like each other. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, yeah, so there's that's the spectrum of firearms museums. And I put in the size of them, too. So um, again, that fuller. Uh, museum isn't nothing to sneeze at. If you're ever here in Chattanooga, uh, it's just south of Chattanooga, like just on the south side of town, if I remember right. It's not even that far south um, before you get to Georgia. And uh, it's a battlefield, so you can look at some cannons and the, again, the green grass. It's just a bunch of grass always. But uh, the building there has the, some kind of house or something has the, uh, the guns. And uh, it's really neat because it starts, I don't I, I guess they were chronologic. For as much as you can do it but they start with the most simple actions and then i mean they developed a lot of different type of mechanisms back in the day and this guy collected them all so it's just row after row after row um, if i remember right the glass was not great for pictures but you could certainly see through it well and you know like you say really long rifles really long bayonets and uh, just the most crazy it's almost like steampunk now, you know, like just sometimes overcomplicated or weird looking operate, you know, me mechanisms. All right. Well, that's Friday. Is anybody out there? One of the four people, five people, four people that bought something at the store today. Um, if you are and you want to request uh, your free patch, feel free in the comments out there. Uh, or, I don't know, I guess on Instagram I posted it today. 
But uh, thanks to the couple people that purchased today. That does help get us to uh, the SHOT Show and make it a little easier. Um, with that, we'll end it. I don't know if Psycho fell asleep or something. Not really giving him questions. But uh, visit any museum and you stand a good chance of learning something. I can put it on the screen. That's a great point. And uh, like I said, going forward with the uh, tour, I'm hoping to get more and more people participating because I think that's the thing. You go to so many museums and they might have a gun or two. And we can start collecting those or acknowledging those, recognizing those too. But with that, looks like we haven't had a comment in a little bit. So we'll say thanks for joining us and uh, stay tuned for more uh, next week. I don't know if Cycle fell asleep or what. Or he's maybe on the phone or something, but. Uh... Nope, just nothing to say. Okay. <laughs> so I'm at no. Thanks for joining us.